Welcome to the start in a Legendarium series about the reputed founders of the first English kingdoms. Today we'll be starting with Hengist of Kent. And like the other reputed founders of the early kingdoms, his story comes to us through a combination of Welsh poetry, Christian chronicles, and local lore that gradually found its way into the larger legend of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Today we'll be talking about how the Romans left Britain, the story of King Vortigern and the Angles, the war between the Britons and the Germanic-speaking peoples who came to the British Isles, the treachery of the Long Knives, and finally the founding of the Kingdom of Kent. During the thousand-year reign of the Roman Empire, Britain served as a central part. Their educated class spoke Latin better than Brythonic, an early form of Welsh spoken by the plebeians of Roman Britain. And though racially Celtic, they saw themselves as both Romans and Christians. However, they were bound to an empire that was failing catastrophically. At first, Britain must have seemed insulated from the wave after wave of nations descending upon the Roman Empire, inflicting one crushing defeat after another upon the legions. However, in the year AD 410, the Roman legions who marched across Britain for almost 400 years simply abandoned the island to defend their crumbling frontiers. The Emperor Honorius simply told the Britons, look to your own defense, and they would have to look well not just from foreigners, but sometimes their own leaders. Various potentates, often local governors and powerful landowners, seized power for themselves by raising peasant militias or hiring mercenaries to both defend their lands and attack the land of rival lords. However, much worse trouble was coming from across the sea. Picts north of Hadrian's Wall and the Irish from across the Irish Sea both invaded England, ransacking towns as they went, even burning churches long regarded as sacrosanct in Christian England. With the cities too dangerous to live in and no Roman trade to finance them, great rivers of humanity abandoned the Roman towns and settled in the countryside. Men with soft hands used to skilled trades had to pick up hammers and sickles and plows and pay tribute to the local strongmen who seized the land and at least claimed to protect them from the Picts and the Irish. However, these landlords with their retinues of sellswords and peasant militias were no match against the invaders. To Christians who never saw foreign invasion, the sight of their churches and towns burning was not just a worldly terror, but yet another sign that the Christian world was ending. In time, a man named Vortigern rose to power among the Romano-Britons. In myth, he is portrayed as a powerful but treacherous monarch. Historically, he was likely a paramount among the petty kings who led a confederation of other regional strongmen in an effort to fight back the invaders. According to legend, in a desperate bid to save Christian Britain, Vortigern made an alliance with the Saxon chiefs Hengist and Horsa, two brother kings renowned for their skill as riders and horse breeders. Indeed, in some early myths that predate the Christian era, they were portrayed as godlike beings in the shape of horses. Modern scholars now think they may have been one man, as both Hengist and Horsa are both Old English words for horse. And it is also possible that Hengist was the source for a character mentioned in Beowulf called Aeton, who may have been based on a Judish chief. And in any case, the brothers themselves would have claimed descent from Woden, a forest god of the North Germans. But whether man or men, or god or horse, Vortigern gave Hengist and Horsa the land southeast of Essex, today part of Kent, in exchange for fighting the Picts and the Irish. True to their word, Hengist and Horsa drove the Picts back north and accepted the land that Vortigern offered, centered on the island of Thanet. Now, the movement of the Germans into Roman Britain was based on a historical migration of German-speaking peoples into the Romano-British Isles. Historically, the Germanic peoples of what is today Denmark and North Germany began to migrate, a few boats at a time, to the eastern coast of England. Their coastal homeland had been flooded by shifts in the continental shelf, with coastal farmland turning into swamps and marshes. So, they had no choice but to migrate. And historically, they did indeed come into conflict with the Romano-Britons, seizing their lands by force. 
and this likely forms the basis for the legend of Hengist and Horsa. Now going back to the legend, Vortigern wished to bind Hengist and Horsa closer to him, so he married their sister, Rowena. And Rowena gained a powerful hold over King Vortigern with her great beauty, using her wiles to milk Vortigern to, into giving the German-speaking peoples ever greater gifts of land and money. And so Hengist and Horsa made themselves very rich and very powerful at the expense of King Vortigern and the Romano-Britons. However, as long as there was peace, the Romano-Britons were willing to suffer King Vortigern's Germanic favorites. However, then the fighting returned. First, the Irish and the Picts returned, followed by Gaelic pirates who ransacked the western coast of what is today northern Britain. And in time, they founded what would become the first Scottish kingdom. And rather than fulfill their obligations to their paymaster and host Vortigern, the Saxon chiefs Hengist and Horsa decided to join the invaders this time, plundering churches and towns. And the Romano-Britons were so enraged at Vortigern's utter failure to defend Christian Britain that the British overthrew him and replaced him with one of his four sons, Vortimir. The newly crowned King Vortimir did battle with Hengist and Horsa. At the fourth and bloodiest battle in the year 455 AD, it was said that 900 men were killed, an astronomical number by the standards of the time. Vortimer also killed one of the two brothers, Horsa, leaving Hengist grieving and vengeful. However, it was Hengist's sister Rowena who would soon help both Vortigern and her surviving brother Hengist. In many ways, Rowena was an early version of the wicked stepmother found so often in fairy tales, and she poisoned King Vortimer, both destroying him and the Romano-Britons' hopes against the Saxons. The Romano-Britons so grieved for their dead monarch that they carried him from one town to another upon his shield, where all of the residents of all of the villages cast ashes upon their heads in mourning. But there was one man in Roman England who did not mourn, and that was King Vortigern. Indeed, his pride and craving for power was such that he did not even think about avenging the death of his firstborn son. No wonder that future writers would regard him as a cautionary tale. But Vortigern had one advantage, besides his wife Rowena. The Romano-British warlords were tired of endless conflict with the Germanic-speaking peoples, and they wanted peace. So when Vortigern promised them that he could make peace with the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes and the other peoples who had come across the sea into the coastal enclave owned by Hengist and Horse, they listened. And so Vortigern was able to arrange a peace meeting at Stonehenge between the Romano-Britons and the Saxons and Angles. However, Hengist had not forgiven or forgotten the death of his brother, though Vortigern had forgotten the death of his son. When the Romano-Britons and Hengrist Saxons met in Stonehenge, King Hengist ordered his men to put long knives into their boots before they surrendered their weapons at Stonehenge, a place of peace. And as the Britons and Saxons met to talk of peace, Hengist ordered his soldiers to take out their daggers with the words, Nemet or Saxus, or get your knives. Hengist himself seized the prideful Vortigern by his cloak, and the Saxons fell upon the unsuspecting Briton nobles and massacred them. Some sources say that 300 Britons were killed, others said that 460 died on the day remembered as the treachery of the Long Knives. Vortigern himself remained a prisoner of Hengist until he was forced to commit one final act of treachery, granting Hengist control of all the Roman towns in what would become the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Kent. He was allowed to keep his crown in his tower, but only as a service of Hengist. However, Vortigern's fast-fading glory did not last long. In some versions of the tale, the enraged Britons rose up against the unhappy king, burning him in his wooden tower. In another version, St. Germanus followed Vortigern from the site of the massacre with other churchmen, and St. Germanus then prayed and fasted to God for three days and three nights. 
And on the third hour of the third night, fire fell from heaven and consumed Vortigern's fortress in divine flames. Vortigern, Rowena, his other wives, and all his followers died in terror and pain. A tragedy for the unhappy king, but the beginning of a new triumph for the Romano Britons as a new leader named Ambrosius Aurelianus rose to f lead them in their fight against the Saxons. Though in later versions, Ambrosius would become Uther Pendragon, the father of King Arthur himself. However, the death of the arch-traitor Vortigern did not bring peace to the Romano Britons. Saxon warbands continued to roam the countryside, mopping up Romano-British enclaves within the new Kingdom of Kent. They made themselves rich at the expense of the Romanized Britons. Indeed, Romano-British belt buckles appeared in Jewish burial grounds, showing us that spoils of war were taken and reused among, as prized possessions for generations among the Germanic invaders. However, King Hengist of Kent soon found a much more formidable enemy in Ambrosius than he had found in Vortigern. The beleaguered British territories began turning civilian buildings into military ones, such as the former Roman temple at the top of Lowberry Hill, which became a lookout point that feast towards the River Thames. And with the Britons gaining the upper hand, and the Saxon fighters finding more profitable work in the civil wars consuming what remained of Roman Gaul, King Hengist chose to make peace. The adventurer of the 440s and the warlord of the 450s became the peacemaker of the 460s, and remained so until his death. However, Hengist had changed a coastal enclave of foreign fighters into a powerful kingdom called Kent. The Saxons allowed the Roman cities to fall into ruin, either dwelling in a few houses and farming among the ruins of old Roman towns, or founding new settlements where they pleased, thus turning the urban Roman Empire into a rural Saxon kingdom. King Hengist ruled until 488, 40 years after his arrival in Roman Britain. When he died, he left his son Oisc as monarch. While King Hengist founded the Kingdom of Kent, the kings of Kent would trace their lineage to Hengist through Oisc, and their royal house was called Oskingus. Now, while the Kingdom of Kent would be eclipsed by East Anglia and Northumbria in centuries to come, it did leave one lasting legacy. The chroniclers condemned Hengist as a treacherous burner of churches, but one of his descendants, Ethelbert, married a Christian and allowed St. Augustine to establish a Catholic church in a kingdom where the pagan god Woden still ruled. King Ethelbert allowed St. Augustine to later establish an archbishopric near Canterbury, which remains the seat of the English archbishops to this day. And that wraps things up for the first episode in the stories of the reputed founders of the first English kingdoms. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. If you've got anything to say, please let me know in the comments section. And I'll have the next video up about Kedrick of Wessex up in a couple of days.